I have great pleasure in declaring the Rugby World Cup of 2003 officially open. In 2003, a nation took their place on rugby's biggest stage for the first time and walked out alongside the number one ranked side in the world, a team that would go on to win that year's Rugby World Cup. So what an exciting time for these two sides. Georgia making its Rugby World Cup debut, the only side of the 20 teams that hasn't been in a World Cup previously. Well, what a moment for this Georgian side. It was only the 58th time that a Georgian national team had taken the field of play. Having only officially been playing international rugby since 1991. And the Georgians, I can tell you, are getting a terrific ovation from this very generous crowd at Subiaco. They're in the World Cup for the first time. They've made one very small step up the ladder, but importantly, they've made that step. A mere 12 years later, this small country in the Caucasus secured automatic qualification for Rugby World Cup 2019. Rugby is considered to be the national game and they're now demanding a seat at the sport's top table. To go from obscurity to prominence in so short a time is nothing short of remarkable. But rugby's next superpower is dreaming of much, much more. According to legend, when God apportioned the earth to all the peoples of the world, the Georgians arrived late. The Lord asked them why they were tardy. The Georgians replied that they had stopped on the way to drink and raised their glasses in praise of him. God was so pleased with their response that he gave the Georgians a part of the earth that he'd been reserving for himself. Situated at the crossroads of Europe and Asia, with the Black Sea to the west and the towering Caucasus Mountains to the north, rugby's rise in what is a relative outpost for the sport is, like much of its ancient culture and heritage, uniquely Georgian. And the affinity for the game predates the game itself. For most of the world, rugby's roots lie in the public school of the same name in Warwickshire, England. But in Georgia, the origins of the game are considered to be a lot closer to home. These rugby seeds go way back. Certainly Georgians think that they, they were the first original people who invented the game. <laughs> and, you know, when you look at Lalo Bertie, you could say they had. Dating back more than 2,000 years, and now a non-material monument of Georgian culture, the sport of Lelo Burti is a brutal fight for local pride in which two teams from separate villages come together and battle to return a ceremonial handmade ball back to their village. There are no boundaries, no time limit, but great honour. The sport was once played across the Guria region of western Georgia and was eulogised in writings by Georgia's great national poet, Shota Rustaveli. <laughs> Now the game is played once a year on Easter Sunday in the village of Shakuti. 
where the upper and lower parts of the village compete to claim the ball for their side, bringing with it the promise of a good harvest and the chance to honour their dead. Strategia. Thats <laughs> Zogorski Damtar de Batamashi, Rafa on the Mogebuli Gundi, he said, in Harris, also got the Sadas Helesi, Ket Relev, Shoris Tamashta, but the Rosa Moita Neben Burtsema took a milk every week. I am tacit. I am shame the cooker, the Gorski Tau, but the Tapsu Tau debit, Bodivart, Takuli Klaus Hari. Lelo Burti is deeply associated with military conflicts of past generations, and Georgia has seen its fair share of those. Viewed as strategically important, the country has been the battlegrounds for Romans, Persians, Arabs, Mongols, Ottomans, Turkmen, Atabegs, and Prussians. Tugada hedo Sakartolo's historias, Mirtevitro, Sakartolo, or this Omshi, or this Prozolashi, Armin de Hais, Davis, Olabarakiro, Meombrebi, Wartes, Awartis, Awart Magram, Pacti Jute, Tugada hedo Sakartolo's historias, Sakartolo's Sakartolo, or this. Ibrzo da taus da satsawat albate supro sis xia guak kartoleps xasia chiguak. One of the things that you can see quite evidently when you actually get into the background of rugby here, it's their modern day, you know, wars that they're fighting because they go onto the pitch and they battle against the next team, and then afterwards everything's done. So I think it suits them psychologically because again it's full contact. Uh, nobody really gets killed in the end, and uh, they can walk away and have a beer afterwards, and so then that suits them as well, you know what I mean? It's a very important thing to do with the people who are in the world. I don't know if I'm going to be a good person, but I'm going it was under the yoke of a more recent occupier that rugby began to take root, despite the best efforts of a man born in Georgia to stifle the game. In 1949, 
during Joseph Stalin's campaign against cosmopolitanism, rugby was labelled as being inconsistent with the moral foundations of the Soviet man, and the Soviet championship was dissolved. After Stalin's death in 1953, rugby was restored and the effect on Georgia was immediate. Once again, the communist world holds a festival of youth, drawing thousands of visitors from both sides of the Iron Curtain. This is the sixth festival and it's in Moscow, but there's a difference. They were designed for the export of ideas, so this time the traffic in ideas proves to be a two-way business. Young people of the East are listening as well as talking to their Western friends. Sansa <laughs> Pranga <laughs> Jagas <laughs> Irveli champion at the Armax of Romel Cells, Magram. Uke give him relatively chamo with the Moscovitan, the Magan Gak at Aragas Nairates. Shemdek Samus Dertel, Sakatos Chamo with the Baton give him relatively, Romas Naha, Ormus that should make us Moscow Shestamashi. The man Patrick or Chess Lois or Gamuchin Zanaga manager Lutisabida. Darts when a soccer team is highly popular, is a sport that is Sporting <laughs> established, the remainder of the 1960s and 1970s saw organic growth of the sport in Georgia, mainly amongst university students. And whilst in Soviet Russia some payments to players were being introduced, Georgia stayed staunchly amateur. Despite this, their clubs began to make an impact on Soviet rugby. And in 1978, Tbilisi-based Lokomotivi became the first Georgian side to lift the Soviet Cup. No, no, no. The main city of what we would see in the is Bolos. What we would see in the Soviet Union is that the Soviet Union is not a country. The Italian people do not speak the language. The cartoon is given to the subject of the Soviet Union. A Georgian rugby federation had been founded in 1964, but there was no Georgian team. 
As the strength of rugby in Georgia increased, so more players from the then Soviet state found themselves representing the USSR. As the 1980s drew to a close, the end of the Soviet era looked imminent, and Georgia began producing representative teams for the first time. Georgia's independence from the Soviet Union was achieved with an overwhelming 99% of the vote in a referendum in April 1991. In November of that year, the rugby team of the newly independent country was victorious over Ukraine in Tbilisi, but the game faced fresh challenges in a country coming to terms with its new status. <laughs> But sporting success became the least of people's concerns as the fledgling nation then turned on itself, entering into a bloody and violent period lasting two years between 1991 and 1993, ravaging the country and its people. Mary, I am a Catholic man, Madam. We have done a lot of sacrifices. 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 Despite the carnage, for the game of rugby at least, there was a ray of hope as the Georgian Rugby Union was accepted as a member of the International Rugby Football Board. Then, with the country still reeling from civil war, a phoenix rose from the flames, and not for the first time, it was French. Microproblems guardam te hi hole interesu da professionalizmi scandal tolva da professionalizmi mašin da itko čamo kali bevo ga bota mašin bši da bota hola ukljamisi. Od svojeg matzanjen pozitivni roli ta mašin ro orija ta sam zos čuje mohti pso prijeće me. On ite dan zina samble fira federacija internacionala rugby amateur i je ite interpelé pendant le congrès par une personne qui est venue se présenter. Voilà, je m'appelle Zaza Katsashvili. Il dit, je suis du Caucase, je suis de, de Géorgie. Vous voyez où c'est Je dis, oui, je vois à peu près, mais... Voilà, nous sommes des passionnés de rugby, nous voulons progresser. Nous sortons d'une crise nationale très forte, où il y avait une guerre civile. Mais là, nous voulons progresser dans le rugby. Est-ce que vous pouvez venir faire un audit et nous dire ce qu'il faut faire Donc, je me suis rendu là-bas. Juillet 95, je suis arrivé à 4 heures du matin. À 10 heures, il m'a mené dans une salle à la Fédération Georgienne de Rugby, dans laquelle il y avait 25-30 personnes. 
joueur, entraîneur. Tableau noir, mon interprète, Georges Chumburidze. Rugby, le somme numéro 1. Et on démarre. Le pays était euh, donc sorti d'une guerre civile. J'avais un garde du corps armé qui me protégeait euh, tous les jours parce que c'était très dangereux euh, au niveau des enlèvements. Donc ils réclamaient des rançons. Enfin, c'était très, très dangereux à ce moment-là. À ce moment-là, même les joueurs euh, portaient sur eux des, des revolvers. Mais quand j'ai vu ces joueurs, que j'ai été sur le terrain, quand j'ai vu la passion des entraîneurs et de tout le monde, quand j'ai vu ce pays, quand j'ai vu ces hommes forts, intelligents, je me suis dit, tu ne peux pas les abandonner, tu ne peux pas les laisser comme ça à leur sort. Et donc, je me suis décidé de les aider. Euh, évidemment, la première chose qu'ils m'ont dit, c'est, mais vous savez, monsieur, on n'a pas d'argent. Je leur ai dit, écoutez, bon, ben, on verra après. Hein. Voilà. Il n'y avait pas d'infrastructure, il n'y avait pas de matériel. Les, les garçons avaient, avaient des chaussures euh, incroyables. Pas de ballon, il n'y avait rien. Il fallait restructurer, d'abord, parce que j'avais des joueurs internationaux qui ne mangeaient pas à leur faim. Comment peut-on faire jouer un joueur de rugby euh, qui a faim, qui ne se nourrit pas correctement c'était pas correct. Rapidement, on a pris la décision avec les dirigeants géorgiens de faire venir ces joueurs en France. And so began a rugby exodus. As a man with an array of networks and connections in his home country, Sorel managed to secure places for ambitious Georgian players throughout France. Even without the coaching structures and the infrastructure within the country, they were still producing rugby players who could go into Europe and play in the professional leagues. And I think let's all be honest here. I mean, if, if Georgia didn't have that avenue of putting players into the French leagues, they wouldn't have got to be the competitive as quickly as they did. And the progression was quick, lightning quick. Less than four years after Sorel's arrival, Georgia narrowly missed out on qualification for the 1999 Rugby World Cup, losing a two-legged playoff to Tonga on aggregate. But the next time around, with Sorel installed as head coach, they were not to be denied, qualifying automatically for the first time. And uh, these guys will need to be fit to stand up, but don't sell them short. The Georgians have no less than 16 of their 30-man squad playing in the French national championship. So they are no slouches. So they are no slouches. Ma souffrance, c'est que eux, je savais qu'ils étaient bien meilleurs que ce qu'ils ont fait ce jour-là. Ils auraient pu faire un bien meilleur match, donner une bien meilleure image. Parce que c'est ce que je recherchais. Je cherchais à faire que on soit, on montre qu'on avait la possibilité un jour d'arriver. Et là, j'ai pas réussi. Mais contre l'Afrique du Sud, nous leur avons résisté pendant plus d'une heure. Ça, c'était un exploit. Bien sûr, nous avons perdu après, mais on leur a marqué un essai.
Et à une, pendant une heure, on était dominateur contre l'Afrique du Sud. C'était extraordinaire. Voilà, c'était ce genre d'exploit que je voulais leur voir faire euh, et, et de préférence contre l'Angleterre, mais passionnant. Voilà. The Lelos of Georgia had arrived, but Sorrell's work was done. Having laid the foundations, he stepped aside to be remembered as the man who changed Georgian rugby forever. His departure could have spelled disaster, but instead, the void he left was filled with people desperate to advance the game that was now being identified as a means of restoring national pride. In episode two, we'll find out how that was achieved.